Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day. Spring has sprung. I would be very happy if we saw a little bit more snow. But for your sake, I won't pray that. Um, I was listening to one of the songs, and, and it brought to mind something. Um, this is just this is just for uh, your edification. Have you noticed that uh, the the Jews do not call God by His proper name, and and people that uh, follow the Messianic Judaism they won't even spell out His name; they'll they'll leave a letter blank. And I find that kind of ironic, because when God called to Moses out of the burning bush. And he told him, I'm sending you to my people Israel. I've heard their cry. Moses says, well, who should I say sent me? How did God respond? I am that I am. Yahweh. He gave to Moses and thus to Israel his name. He gave it to us. Because we're, we're the adoptees. We are grafted into the root. He has given us his name, Yahweh, Jehovah, El Shaddai, the Mighty One, the Almighty. And I wonder sometimes if we have, in our efforts to honor God, not stripped some of who he is away from him. Because when God identified himself to Moses, it was a personal, intimate revelation. And when he told Moses to explain to the people of Israel who he was, he said, this is who I am. I am the eternally self-existent one. I am that I am. I need nothing, but I desire to have relationship. And it just makes me pause and, and wonder, how much in our Christian life have we stripped away from God in our efforts to, to uh, keep Him holy, to keep Him separate? And I wonder if that's not a problem. Because the whole point of Christ coming and Him going to the cross was to remove the barriers of separation <clears throat> so that we could stand before God with His absolute unconditional holiness, his righteousness. All this time, God has been working so very hard to bring us to him, and we come and we go, oh, you're so holy, I'm going to stop here. And yet, scripture says that he wants to pick us up as a lamb and carry us close to his heart. I don't see how you can get much more intimate than that. We have been talking <clears throat> about our identity in Christ. And I'm, I'm actually going to hit a number of points today, but just to catch you up with where we are, um, 2 Corinthians 5.12 says that, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Okay? And we talked a little bit about, you know, we are crucified with Christ, we are buried with Him, and we are resurrected into new life. But what does that new life look like? Well, by its very definition, it can't look like the old life. So what are we to take on then? We, we are no longer a slave to sin. We are no longer obligated to sin. That, that's a, a thing that I really... It, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around. You don't have to sin anymore. Sin is not your master. You have been set free. You have taken on a new master who gives you freedom. We are reconciled to God, meaning that we estranged ourselves, we separated ourselves from Him, and He has made a way that that barrier could be removed and we can be reunited with Him. So we have forsaken the old master of sin. We have embraced a new master, God. 
We are children of God. You know, we hear that all the time. Oh, we're all God's children. No. God says we're not. God says to them that believe, he gave the right to be called the sons of God. And before you get all caught up in gender, that word means sons and daughters. It's like offspring. Okay? So, to them that believe, they are the children of God. If you don't believe, you're not a child of God. It's that simple. Okay? So, you are a child of God. Now, last week we talked about uh, another aspect of what we are. Jesus calls us friends. He says, I no longer call you servant. I, I don't call you slave. Even though that relationship dynamic is correct, he is the master, we are the servant. He says, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend. Because the master servant doesn't know what his plans are. But I've told you everything. So we have not only the right to be called the children of God, but we have the right to be called the friends of God. And, and through all the scripture, I, did anybody ever find anyone other than Abraham that was called a friend of God? Us. We are called friends of God. So now there's a couple of attributes about this new nature that I want to hit today. We're going to kind of go through these fairly quickly. So if you have your Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 4. creation, we get access to God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Actually, I'm going to back up to 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, the first part of this is significant because that last phrase, the confidence that we have, is based on the first, the, the preceding verses. Okay? And the writer of Hebrews is, is setting up and establishing that Jesus is our great high priest. Now, Peter goes on, and Peter says that we are a royal priesthood. Now, to us, we, we don't really blink over that. But to the Jews, that's something that can't be. Because the royal lineage came through David, who was of the tribe of Judah. Judah. And yet the priesthood was of the tribe of Levi. Levi. Okay? So to say a royal priesthood is, is something that for the history of the Old Testament, it doesn't work. It doesn't mesh. Okay? It, it's almost like an oxymoron. But Peter calls us a royal priesthood. And he's basing that off of what this writer is trying to tell us in Hebrews. Because this writer is telling us that Jesus was not a priest, a high priest of the order of Aaron. But he's a high priest of the order of who? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Okay? Now, backing up, we're, we're going to hit a little bit of Old Testament history. Who was Melchizedek? He was the king of Salem, a high priest to God. And when Abraham went and he, he wiped out the Midianites and he gathered back his people and he was coming back, he came across Melchizedek. And he offered unto Melchizedek a tithe, 10%, tithe just means 10%, of everything that he had gained back. And this Melchizedek is, is, is kind of a, a unique character in history because here we have a high priest of God, but we don't have a people of God for him to be a high priest to yet. 
So he's a foreshadow of what was to come, but he's not a foreshadow of the Aaronic priesthood. He's not a foreshadow based on being a descendant of Levi. He's not even a foreshadow based on being a descendant of Abraham. He's a foreshadow of the Son of God who would become our high priest. Okay? So the writer in Hebrews is setting up that Jesus Christ is our high priest. At one and the same time, he is also the perfect lamb sacrificed for all sin. And so he establishes this principle that Jesus being the perfect man, the perfect lamb, who was sacrificed, has become our high priest. And because of this, since then, we have the great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Now, what is confession? Do you guys know what confession means? It, literally, it means to agree. It's that simple. And our confession is that what God says is so, is so. And oftentimes, we, we only leave that confession in area of sin. Now that's important because when God reveals to us that we have sin, when we confess that sin, we're simply agreeing with God that what we've done is wrong. Okay? That's, that's all confession is. Okay? We, we've made it this great oogie boogly monster. Really, it's, it's deliverance because we are aligning ourselves with the will, the plan, and the purpose of God when we confess our sins. We are acknowledging before one another that, hey, God's right. I was wrong. It's that simple. All right? Now, as part of confession, then, we move on to repentance. Okay? And, and repentance is not just apologizing. Okay? One of those things that I've shared with you guys before, Christy learned really quickly how to manipulate Scripture to get me. <laughs> Well, I did too, but, you know, I, I'm using her as my scapegoat. <laughs> we would get into a disagreement, and Christy is a non-confrontation person. And so, in order to end the argument, she'd go, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, forgive me. And here I've built up a full head of steam, and I'm ready to just go for the long haul. And she just took all the steam right out of my engine. Because now, where's the obligation? That's on me. Now I gotta forgive her. And I got this full head of steam going to prove my point and to be right and to show her she's wrong. And she just cut me off at the knees. And it was just do, do, doing that just so I have to forgive you. When you're angry, that actually makes sense. You know, when you're not angry, you realize how stupid that sounds. Okay? But repentance is actually turning away, okay? It's literally to turn your cheek, to turn, okay? So when you confess, you're saying, yeah, God, I agree with you. I was wrong. And then the repentance part is furthering that agreement. I won't do that anymore. I'm going to do this. You said go this way. I chose to go this way. This was the wrong way. That's confession. Repentance is turning around and going the way he told you to, okay? So let's, let's get back into Hebrews. <clears throat> okay, so um, hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay, every temptation that you will face was laid before Jesus. He wasn't just tempted in the wilderness those three times. Okay, we see over and over again things that were thrown in front of them. Sometimes even from the disciples. You know, Peter. I love Peter. Because Peter just laid it out there. Everything for everybody to see. And he was so sure of himself. You know, and he's, oh, Jesus, this will never happen while I'm with you. And Jesus turns and looks at him and, and he rebukes the devil. And he says, get behind me. Because you don't have in mind the things of God. Peter's like, Me? Are, you, are we still conversing here? Because here Peter thinks he's doing a great thing. Jesus is talking about going up to be crucified, being handed over to the pagans. And, and Peter's like, yeah, nah, man, I got your back. 
This will never happen. And Jesus looks right at him. So I love Peter. But Jesus was tempted in every way that we've been tempted, yet he was without sin. Now, that, I think, just goes to show the nature of which God was willing to go to get us out of the hole that we're in. That he would not only choose... Philippians chapter 2 tells us that Jesus, who is very nature, being in nature God, Jesus, who was God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead took upon himself the likeness of man. He chose to become a man. So first, he humbles himself from the highest position in all of creation, actually even outside of creation, because there is no higher position anywhere, ever. He chose to remove himself from that position and come down and take upon himself the nature of man, and not just man, but a servant, okay? It would have been one thing if he came down and told Caesar, <laughs> sorry, but off the throne, I'm here. But he came and he was born in a stable. And he grew up in a very lowly condition of life. Okay? This ought to indicate to you the lengths to which God was willing to go to save you. Personally, to save you. We like to generalize salvation, and it is because it's offered to everyone. But salvation is, of all things, uniquely personal. Because only you can accept it. I, I, I would love to be able to accept it for all of you. We all getting saved. You don't have a choice. I decided. But I don't get that. It's personal. Because it's something that has to take place between the creator and the specific creation. Okay? So Jesus was tempted in every way. Okay? So not only did he reduce himself from his rightful place to, to being like one of us, but he became like the lowest of us. And then he was tempted in every way, yet did not sin. Which is amazing because Jesus completely changed the definition of sin in the Sermon on the Mount, remember? And he said, you know, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. Well, I'm good. I haven't killed anyone. <laughs> but I tell you the truth, if you hate your brother, you have committed murder. Oh, I'm host. I'm in trouble. <clears throat> Again, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. I'm all right. I'm good. But I tell you the truth. Oh, he's got to stop there. <clears throat> if you have looked at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery. I am so host. Because God revealed to us that sin is not what you do. It's what's inside of you. What you do is just birthed out of what's already in your heart. Okay? So he completely changed the definition of sin for us. And if anything, he made it even that much more desperate. Wow, we are really without hope. So here's Jesus, who has redefined the nature of sin and really given it to us as God sees it. And yet he was without sin. So not only, you know, did he not hate those who were persecuting him, did he not hate the Pharisees, the, the palace guard, the Romans, Pilate. Not only did he not hate those people, he went so far as to say, Father, forgive them. And man, that's, that's got to be something incredible for someone to call out on behalf of the persecutor. <coughs> God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Okay. So he's been everywhere that we have ever been and yet was without sin. So he's the perfect spotless lamb. Then it says, let us then, then is there because of what came before, what we just talked about, with confidence. With confidence. Why can we be confident? Because of everything Jesus has just done, that, that we've just heard. If Jesus has gone to this great length to bring us to this place, we can then, with confidence, approach the throne of grace. 
We can come before that throne where God sits. That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, mercy and grace, those are two sides to the same coin. Okay? Grace You got what you didn't deserve. Mercy, you didn't get what you deserved. Okay? Because before God, we had no right to expect that he would be gracious to us, that he would give us anything. And yet he did. He gave us eternal life. Mercy, before God, we should have been punished and cast off eternally. But he chose not to do that. So both sides of those things, you are getting something you didn't deserve, and you are saved from something you did deserve. We can, with confidence, approach the throne of God. As a believer, sealed with God's Spirit, we can have this confidence. This is part of the new creation that we are. All right? Let's look at another attribute. Let's look at something else that, that um, he has given us. Turn to James 1. Next, next book, chapter 1. Here's something else that we have access to. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 5. Um, James is a, an interesting book. As a matter of fact, uh, even Martin Luther did not want the book of James in the canonized scripture because he felt like James dwelt too much on works. But I don't believe that at all. I believe James is establishing the clear priority of works laid out in Ephesians chapter 2 by Paul, 8, 9, and 10. We're not saved by works, okay? We're saved by grace through faith, not of works that anyone would boast, okay? So we know salvation is a faith and grace equation. But then Paul tells us that when that has been secured, when God has given that to us and we have received it, then we work, okay? It follows after. And that's what the entire book of James is, is kind of built on, is, okay, you, you say you've come to Christ, You've got faith. You've got salvation. Do something with it. Don't continue as you were. Do something with it. Faith will always be proved by its works. So in verse 5, another attribute. If any of you lacks wisdom, does anybody here lack wisdom? Let him ask God, who gives generously to all, without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Okay? Now... When we come to God and ask Him for wisdom, what do we have to do? You've got to believe you're going to get it. Okay. Now, <coughs> keep in mind, wisdom comes in various shades. Okay. Wisdom is not necessarily knowledge. Okay. There's people that have a lot of knowledge and have no wisdom. Okay. Wisdom would be the proper application of the knowledge that you have. But... God is gracious even in that because sometimes God gives us wisdom in areas we have no knowledge in. Why? Because his spirit is in us and his spirit knows all things. Okay? But when we ask God for wisdom, trust he will give it to you. Don't tell God, God, I need your wisdom, and then go buy every self-help book. Okay? Trust that he will give you what he has said he will give you because he gives generously without reproach, without finding fault, okay? That really reveals a lot about a person when they lay before God, they're asking a petition from God, and then they start bouncing, don't they? And that really, the, the scripture puts it pretty bluntly. Let's look at this again. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Stand firm. Plant your feet. Be unmoved. 
When everything looks wrong around you, stand firm. He's given you his truth. His truth says that if you lack wisdom, ask and it will be given. Stand firm. Wait. Wait on him. He will give it to you. It is coming. Sometimes he's got to deliver it three or four times before we actually hear and understand. Okay? So, as a believer, as a new creation, we have access to come with confidence before the throne of grace. We have access to wisdom, not of our own, but of him. What else do we get? Let's look at a, a couple other things here. Um, flip over to Romans chapter 8. then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's look at this for just a second. If God is for you, who can stand against you? Now, there's a lot of people that are going to come against you. Okay? But if God is for you, you will have victory. Now keep in mind, folks, um, this is not a prosperity teaching. I'm not telling you that if God is for you, your life is going to be roses. What I'm telling you is that if God is for you, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of turmoil and trouble, he will be that calm and steady presence that brings you through. That when everything is falling apart around you, you will be the one that rests in his peace. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we have an intercessor. Verse 34. He died for us, he is raised, and now he is at the right hand of God and is interceding for you. You have someone to plead your case. Who brings your cause before the Almighty. Now remember, the devil is known as the accuser. And we see this, this displayed as in a courtroom with the Father as the judge. <laughs> The devil as the prosecutor and the son as the defending attorney. And the devil brings his case. God, let us examine the history of said person. You, me. I bring exhibit A. 
And starting with the first sin in your life, he will carefully lay out in great detail, excruciating detail, every sin that you've ever committed. And God the Father, who is the perfect judge, who doesn't need the devil to lay these things out for him because he already knows them, turns to Jesus and says, how does your client plead? And his son says, he pleads the blood of my, myself. He's covered. The debt is paid in full. There is nothing owing. Case dismissed. Case dismissed. Now, that only happens if you have in faith, believing what you don't see, accepted Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior. You can't take one without the other. They, they, it's, it's all knitted together as one thing. Okay? So, he's our intercessor. Well, let's go on. What shall separate us? Look at, look at these things that he lists. Um, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Now, we, we like to look at these things as you know, if we're a Christian, these don't come on us. But that's not what Paul is writing, is it? As a matter of fact, he's saying quite the opposite. He says, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, these things that he just listed, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why? Because none of these things can separate us from that love. What, what, what? Angels, rulers, death, life, things present, things past, powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. He starts this list and then he goes, well, you know what? Nothing. Nothing can separate us from his love. Now, I just have one little deviation that I want to put right here. Are you part of his creation? Are you a part of this all creation? Mm -hmm. Then not even you can separate yourself from his love. Did you get that? So, when we come to him, when we become a new creation, there are a series of things that we immediately gain access to. We gain access to the throne of God. Now this is significant. Again, going back to that royal priesthood. Peter calls us a royal priesthood because our lineage is of that of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent top to bottom, exposing for the first time since its creation the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat. Which, which we can get into that conversation a little bit later. But God is in essence telling us, come in, all who would. Come in. But there's only one way in. The blood of the Lamb. Okay? Because it's just, just like that courtroom scenario. Everybody's going to stand there one day. Everybody's going to stand there one day. Everything that you've done in your life is recorded. And if you do not have Jesus as your intercessor, and that blood mark is not on you, <coughs> what happened if the high priest came in, and he came in with sin? He died. He was stricken dead. Boom. Just like that. Just like that. And it's the same way in eternity. When we come before God, if we have not had all of our sins removed, if we don't have that blood mark, we enter death for eternity. Okay? So, I mean, really this is a no-brainer choice, right? I mean, you, you accept what God has done, and he gives you all of these benefits. You're a new creation. You're no longer a slave to sin. You've been reconciled to God. You have a right relationship with your creator. 
You have access to come boldly into his throne. He calls you friend. He calls you child. You're his child. Or you can do it all on your own. And then when you come into the presence of the Almighty, into that immaculate holiness without blemish, let's see how you're able to defend yourself. Honestly, I want someone that knows the rules defending me. Because when it's said and done, the one thing in all my life I want to hear, the one thing I want to hear is I want to hear my Father in Heaven say, well done. That more than anything. I want to hear him say, well done. Okay? Enter into your father's rest. Enter into the master's rest. I want to know when I stand before him that he is pleased with what I did, with what he gave me. Whether it be five, three, or one, I want to know whatever he gave to me, I did well by. Okay? I want him to be pleased with me. Now, we stand before God with the blood mark of Jesus Christ. Our sins are washed away. They're forgotten. They're removed as far as the east is from the west. Okay? God remembers them no more. Which is weird because he's omniscient. He knows everything. But he chooses to forget. What an incredible thing that God chooses to forget. And then we enter in to eternity, not only you know just sneaking in, but with his blessing, with his welcome. Amen. Amen. Father, we bless you today. That Father, when we came to you, we didn't take upon ourselves rules and regulations, but we entered into a dynamic, intimate relationship <coughs> with the Almighty God the sovereign creator of all things. And Father, you have accepted us by grace through faith. And even that faith you have built up in us. I ask, Lord God, Father, if there would be any here that do not know that they have that blood mark on them, that they have been covered and washed and completely cleansed. Father, I'm asking that today would be the day of salvation. Father, that today would be the day they call out to you. And they start a new life, created anew to be all that you have purposed them to be. And I ask, Father, that you would continue to grow us in you. Father, you'd continue to teach us to walk according to your spirit, to deny our flesh, to resist the evil one, to stand firm where you have placed us, to trust you in all things. <clears throat> teach us, Father, to die to ourselves to prefer one another, even to love our enemies, that we might be more and more like your son and less and less like ourselves. We bless you this morning, Father, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>